All right, good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our virtual presentation on avalanche airbags with Portland Mountain Rescue's Christopher Van Tilburg. Christopher is an accomplished outdoors person and is widely involved with the outdoor medical communities, including search and rescue for crag rats, Portland Mountain Rescue, Clackamas County and Pacific Northwest um, Search and Rescue. He is also the author of one of the favorite uh, books over at the mountain shop. It's the Backcountry Ski and Snowboard Routes in Oregon. Uh, so no stranger to the mountains and things to consider in winter conditions. Um, I'm Jess from Mountain Shop and I'm excited to host Christopher tonight. He'll tell us about airbag technology and give us some things to consider when building out um, our avalanche kit for the season. So feel free to type questions into the chat. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll answer things at the end. Oh, well, sorry, someone just dropped something into the chat. Um, we'll answer things at the end. So uh, with that, I will pass things over to Christopher. Welcome, Christopher. Thanks very much, uh, Jess. I'm really happy to be here and thanks everybody for joining in. Um, let me just get my screen shared. Is that coming through okay? Yep. Okay, um, so I'm really happy to be here on behalf of Portland Mountain Rescue, and I really greatly appreciate the um, the uh, community cooperation that uh, the Mountain Shop and Portland Mountain Rescue have had for a number of years. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this to about 30 minutes uh, of of me talking, and then we can questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about airbags, and really what I I set out to do when I started looking into this topic is trying to figure out why um, or, or if airbags should be standard safety equipment. We think of transceiver, shovel, and probe as the trifecta that we ought to carry in the mountains in the winter and in the uh, spring backcountry season, but we're not universally carrying airbags and why not? How well do they work? So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about how well they work and um, and um, let me see if I can get my screen to forward here. And uh, a little bit about how about they, how they work and how to choose an airbag. So <clears throat> this is a picture from Mount Bachelor. I took this picture when I was on the chairlift while I was I was down there looking into a uh, snow uh, tree well death. And I took this picture while I was on the chairlift while the resort was operating. And this is the Cirque um, and this is an open air, this was open to skiers. So these skiers right here, if you see them are um, just in the resort skiing on a lift ticket. This picture, you probably recognize this. This is uh, the reason why Heather Canyon in Mount, in Mount Hood Meadows is closed when it's closed. So this is the Wise face slide. This is a picture from about 10 years ago. This slide, this debris pile is about 17 feet deep was estimated. And this came from the Y East face, which uh, it, it um, the uh, crown was at a, was around 9,000 feet and this slid all the way to the bottom of the Heather Canyon chairlift. Um, this picture I took just last spring when I was up touring with some mountain rescue colleagues. This is uh, Castle Craig's on the left. Crater Rock on the right. This is the south side of Mount Hood. That's the summit right in the middle of the picture. And this is a wet slide in the spring. Very popular touring destination. Um, this is Newton Canyon. And many of you have probably been to Newton Canyon. This is a very small kind of slough that's enough to knock somebody off their feet. And this is the same. This is a little bit later on the same day with some other mountain rescue colleagues. And uh, there's some, you can see right in the middle of this gully there, there's a little slide. Um, in that picture. And so, and this is, this is one from last year also. This one was on social media. If you follow the Backcountry Tours um, Facebook page, this was a White River Headwall that slid and caught a skier and uh, there's no injuries, I think, or minor, minimal injuries. So the reason I want to show all these is because avalanches happen in the backcountry more than we hear about them. We don't, we only hear about the big catastrophic uh, avalanches and the big fatalities. We haven't had a fatality in an avalanche on Mount Hood in many, many years, but we have had some near misses. And so avalanches happen a lot more than we think they do. And so they are fairly um, dangerous. This is a picture 
pictures is from the Wallawa Mountains, and this is in February this year. This is a tour that I was on. This is an avalanche that my group caused, and this is a, a really scary situation because we had one person trigger it. We had a spotter. We had people at the bottom in a safe spot. We had people on the top of the same, same, same in a safe spot. And I was at the bottom, and I heard this loud boom with my buddy Eric, who's a life flight nurse, and we both looked up to the sky because we thought an airplane was going overhead. And Mike, who's here in this picture, who triggered the avalanche, didn't hear the boom at all, but he heard our spotter yell avalanche and he zipped out to the side and was safe. And so this is the same avalanche, um, but it, the odd thing about this, or the, the thing that was most scary is the slide I just showed you the picture of is off to the left. The picture that you see the ski tracks in is less than 30 degrees, so it didn't slide. And the energy for the avalanche traveled over and triggered this slope. So this is a remotely triggered slope. I got a video here of the whole thing. I think this will play. So you can see it's kind of two avalanches uh, with the slope in the middle uh, was spared. So, some background, maybe this is a little bit of review for people. We have about 30, um, we have about, sorry, 29 average avalanches per year in the United States, around, averaging 29. We've had some years, you can see there, that are 36, 35. We've had a couple of years, nobody really knows why in 2015, 16, and 2017, 18, we had really low numbers of avalanche uh, fatalities. Uh, those were pretty good snow years, so it didn't have, we don't, we don't think it had to do with the snowpack. And uh, does anybody know how many avalanche fatalities we had in the year of COVID in 2021? Record setting, 37. So fair number of avalanches. This picture might also be review, but this picture is important because it shows you why avalanche transceivers don't save very many lives. So the, um, the cause of death for avalanche fatalities is 24% of its trauma, 74% uh, is suffocation when you're buried, and a very small number is hypothermia. And so avalanche beacons, avalanche transceivers rather, really don't work very well to save lives because if you're not dead from trauma and you get buried in a slide, it's more often than not, you're buried too deep and too long to survive. And so the beacons just... Uh, or the transceivers aren't very effective. This is another very famous slide um, that really demonstrates your chance of survival is pretty good for the first five to 10 minutes, but after 25 minutes, it plummets. So by the time you're calling for help with, from somebody like Portland Mountain Rescue or Mountain Meadow Ski Patrol or Timberline Ski Patrol, the chances of survival plummet. So, uh, this talk today, I'm going to talk about why we're not using airbags universally. And I wrote this paper. This is an assigned a medical journal. Uh, it's kind of the same talk. And what I was going to change the talk, I have given this talk to a couple of rescue groups, but I decided to kind of leave it uh, the same. Um, uh, I, it's a little bit on the scientific side, but in today's world, especially with the COVID pandemic, you know, we, there's all kinds of information that is available and you never know how accurate it is, if you, especially if you read it on social media. Um, and so instead of trying to um, convince people one way or another, I'm just going to give you the information uh, based on some science and then you can decide. Okay. So airbags started a long, long time ago, uh, 40 some years ago. Uh, this in the middle here pictures the guy who, Peter Auschwer, who's a German who invented it uh, in 1985 is when he um, showed it. The professional groups originally start uh, embraced airbag usage, mostly in Europe. This is the International Commission for Alpine Rescue, uh, which embraced airbags uh, back in 2006 as an important safety device. But in the United States, uh, North America, really professionals were have not really embraced airbags much. This is a textbook for mountain medicine and technical rescue, which is published in 2018, which doesn't address airbags. Uh, the professional organizations, uh, American Avalanche Association, ARI, which is a very popular certification nonprofit, and the Canadian Avalanche Association and Avalanche Canada, they just barely uh, address 
airbag usage. And what we need, I think, as consumers is some guidance. You know, what works, what doesn't work? How often should I bring it? Should I bring it on every ski tour? Should I only bring it on high risk ski tours? Um, and so there's really a need for these professional organizations to address um, airbags. And so this is another medical journal article, which uh, really sort of promotes airbags, but not much. So largely what we're doing here is trying to figure out what works. Okay. So this, you know, and I put this uh, scientific method in just because I'm, I, as in my, in my other job, I deal with COVID uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, we're really trying to uh, look at um, this from a scientific standpoint. So you observe a problem, avalanches, you ask the question, do airbags work? You do all the research, which I'm going to show you. And then you come to a hypothesis, which I don't know if I have an answer for you tonight, but I'm going to pose a couple uh, hypotheses. The problem with avalanches, it's really hard to test um, uh, hypotheses. It's really hard to do simulate avalanches. And there's a fair number of this in Europe, but it doesn't uh, it's very difficult to do it. Um, and so uh, we're going to do our best tonight to kind of go through the science. It's a little bit of a game, right? So the game is you got to get to the bottom of the slope safety. So it's kind of like this game, right? See this? Red light, green light. So we have to get to the bottom of the slope safely. So do airbags work? Yes, they work to save lives. So um, morbidity and mortality are medical terms that mean uh, preventing injury and preventing death. And so they, we know that they work to prevent burials. We think they probably work to prevent trauma, and they might even work to prolong your survival once you're completely buried uh, under the snow. So I'm going to talk about that. So I'm going to show you a couple studies here. This is a friend of mine, Herman Brueger, who runs a, a mountain rescue research center in Bolzano, Italy. And he did a study in 2007 that showed that airbags reduce your chance of dying 16%. And this number failure rate, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, uh, the failure rate for airbags is 20%. So this is another friend of mine, Pascal Hegley, who uh, is a Canadian researcher. And this is probably one of the most widely cited studies in 2014, he found that you reduced your chance of dying by 23%. So uh, this is okay, it's not that great, but I mean, think of a COVID vaccine reduce your chance of dying, uh, depending on the vaccine, somewhere between uh, 74 and 95%. So an airbag, it's okay, it's not great. So um, it's gonna, it's, it's helpful. Hegley also um, found a 20% failure rate. So this is a fabulous study. I wish I was participating in the study as a researcher, not a victim, but this is a really uh, fabulous study. So uh, Meyer and Harvey, they took crash test dummies. They took 19 of them. And um, I think 14 of them, they strapped on airbags and five of them, they didn't. And there were several that they had to, uh, that didn't work. They threw them into an avalanche in Davos, Switzerland. And this is what they found. They found that Airbags decreased burial significantly. So 42 centimeters buried without an airbag, 15 centimeters, so a foot or so with an airbag. So the, the really important thing is visibility. You can see down here visibility. So of the five without airbags, only one was visible out of the avalanche. So to find the other four, they had to get out their beacons. But of the airbag dummies, 100% were visible abbreviating the need for a beacon altogether. So important, right? So this is what I carry. This is what I carried all last year. I use the, um, you know, I have an aluminum shovel. I have a carbon probe, which I would recommend for some people, but not all. You have to really be careful with carbon that you don't damage it. Um, and I have this, uh, the, the small compact um, peeps beacon. And I use this, uh, the pack I used most, most of the time last year is the Scott um, I think this is the E1 Patrol, which is an electronic fan airbag that runs on a capacitor that you charge up and then has AA battery um, backups. So let's look at avalanche transceivers compared to airbags. Now, remember, a transceiver is really low in the rescue list of priorities or the safety list. So 
first you want to do is avoid avalanches. Second, you want to do is avoid burial or getting hurt if you're caught. And that's where an airbag comes in. And then the third thing is survival if you're buried. And you can see rescuing with a transceiver shovel probe is, is really low down on the list. So whole rider also in Europe studied um, avalanche transceivers back in 2005. Now this study was done before the modern beacons that have triple antenna and digitally processed uh, signals. And so probably modern transceivers are a little bit better than this, but you can see here burial time was dramatically reduced. So buried 120 minutes versus 20 minutes with a avalanche transceiver but it didn't save very many lives. It only reduced your chance of dying 14%. And the reason is because so many people buried are, are just um, dead before you can dig them out. And so Herman Brueger found pretty much the same information. So beacon works, but it doesn't work very well. And if you look at the mortality risk, the chance of dying, the airbags work a little bit better than a transceiver. Than a transceiver. So does the type of airbag matter? Um, probably. So the fan airbags, the electronic fan airbags have the advantage of us being able to practice with them over and over easily because you charge them up and deploy them. And the peeps or the, uh, the peeps or the black diamond jet force, uh, you can deploy it five or six times on a single charge. The one I have, the Scott, you can deploy it twice on a charge. Um, and so I told you there's a 20% failure rate. That's mostly uh, user error, but not always. Now I should mention avalanche transceivers have just as uh, high of a failure rate. So this isn't just um, airbags. Transceivers also have a failure rate. Every year, including last year, we have people that um, unfortunately die and they've got a beacon that's turned off in their backpack or it's turned off, it's in their car. So the fans are easier to uh, easier to travel with, and they're easier to practice with. The compressed gas canisters in the United States, this is mostly compressed air. Uh, those are less expensive and lighter, and so that's a huge bonus. And so you just kind of have to like look at both uh, situations and see maybe what uh, works best for you. They're both really great airbags. I have a canister airbag. I have a couple, two canister airbags, and I and those are used the Alpride system, which are smaller canisters, uh, 60 gram um, cartridges, kind of like the same cartridge that you find in a stand-up paddle inflatable life vest. Does balloon size matter? Um, probably if, you know, these airbags work by um, uh, granular convection, which is a fancy term for the reason why the Brazil nuts end up at the top of the mixed nump jar. So basically in a series, in a flow, particles, if you shake up particles or if particles are flowing, the large ones end up, end up at the top. So the way these work is it increases your volume. So if you, these, uh, most airbags now use the European standard of 170 liters. So it's a pretty big balloon. Um, more than 170 liters would probably um, float somebody better but um, then there's all kinds of design issues because the fan has to be bigger and the canister has to be bigger. And so this is kind of what's um, been settled on is 170 liters. Um, the shape matter, uh, probably, um, we don't know for sure. This is the Mammut airbag. You know, this encases your whole, your whole head and neck. I don't know if you, uh, I think it was in the news in 2018, we had a ski patroller up on Mount Hood Meadows doing, um, control work on God's wall in Heather Canyon and got caught by an avalanche and survived. Uh, he feels that the airbag saved his life because it protected him from trauma and kept him from being burial. He was uh, tumbled uh, over a cliff, hit a tree, went through a couple strainer trees and ended up completely buried face down unconscious with, except for a little corner of his airbag was showing. And, um, and he survived and did just fine and fully recovered. Uh, does a balloon make an air pocket? It might, you know, this is an interesting concept because if you're fully buried in an avalanche, the, the three things that are gonna save your life are one, not having your mouth full of snow, two, having an air pocket, um, a space around your mouth to breathe, and three is have your buddies um, 
dig you out. And so this pack, this is now, I think, marketed as the Jet Force Pro, Black Diamond Jet Force Pro. But this pack has a fan, inflates the airbag, takes about a minute to inflate the airbag, or probably not that long, it's probably um, 20, 30 seconds. And then after three minutes, the airbag uh, deflates. So if you're fully buried, you've got a, a deflated balloon. So does this work? Well, uh, my friend, uh, Scott McIntosh, who's down at the University of Utah, he took 12 volunteers. I don't know if they were medical students or just really needed, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever he paid them. He buried uh, 12 of them and um, dug a hole, deployed the airbag, threw them in the hole, covered them up really quickly with snow, and then let the airbag deflate. And uh, they lasted quite a uh, long time. They lasted uh, 60 minutes, uh, most of them. And um, and uh, these are some fancy medical terms. Well, some of these you might understand, you know, uh, oxygen saturation. He measured oxygen saturation. He measured heart rate. He measured respiratory rate. And he measured end tidal CO2. So your carbon dioxide that you expel is why we think people suffocate in avalanches because you are breathing out carbon dioxide into your little enclosed um, air pocket and you're diluting the oxygen. So as every time you breathe back in, you're diluting oxygen more and more and eventually you have no more oxygen and only carbon dioxide. So that's why that measurement is important. Um, I'm just gonna, I just threw in a couple of slides here about air, air diverters, just because I sometimes get questions about them. These aren't available in the United States anymore. It was the air diverter that we had available for a while was the Black Diamond Avalon. And many of you, probably some of you probably had this. Um, these work very well to prolong survival if you're fully buried under the snow for the reason I just told you, they shoot your expired air out to your back and then you breathe in fresh air, oxygen rich air uh, from the port on your chest. And uh, Colin Grissom and Herman Bruger both looked at these in 2000 and 2003 and basically realized that they worked um, quite well and uh, prolonged survival, but they never really caught on. You can get, um, the reason I wanna mention is there are some guides um, particularly in the big mountains in Canada and uh, in Alaska that use both an airbag and an avalung or an air diverter that's zip tied to their, um, the shoulder of their backpack strap. So here's a, this pack here on the left is uh, an Italian backpack that's made by Farino and it has both an air diverter on one side and, and a um, avalanche bag on the other, the handle there is sticking out on the other side. Um, so can equipment be standardized? Um, this is a big problem, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, avalanche transceivers weren't standardized. We had one frequency in the United States and in Europe, they had a different frequency and the international mountain rescue, uh, community got together to try to pick one, picked one frequency. So all avalanche transceivers were standardized. Well, that hasn't really been done yet with canister airbags and it might in the future, but it would really help. I went on a trip to the Wallawas a few years back and we had uh, three or four different brands of airbags and everybody had a different canister. And so we couldn't just bring one extra canister. Everybody had to bring a second canister if they wanted one. And so um, most of the canister packs we have in the United States are either the small sealed cartridge, like the Alpride system or the um, refillable ones like from Backcountry Access and the Mammut, which are great. The refillable ones, the Mountain Shop will refill them, I think for 20 bucks. And that's a great way to practice with it and get it refilled. Um, but they're not, um, the connections aren't universal. So why aren't we using all using airbags all the time? Like we're all using transceivers all the time. Well, it comes down to a lot of factors. These are some of the factors. I'm gonna run through these quickly and then we can, have time for questions, but it comes down to mostly weight and lack of really professional guidance um, for those of us who are consumers. So availability really isn't a problem anymore because the airbags are readily available, especially in North America, um, not all over the world, but there's uh, lots of great airbag packs and the Mountain Shop has great selection. And so that isn't really as much of a problem as it used to be. The size and the weight is a big deal. Um, so the, the, the 
um, lightest airbag pack you can get right now, empty, but with a canister is um, just a tad under two kilograms. So about four and a half pounds, as opposed to like a standard pack, which is, you know, maybe one pound or half a pound. And so they're, they're definitely heavy. And yeah, I've talked to a fair number of mountain guides who said, yeah, I can have access to a free pack, but I don't want to take it because it's heavy. And on one hand, I understand, you know, a mountain guide is maybe in a, you were in a uh, backpack on skis 150 days a year. So it's any, anytime you can shed weight is important. On the other side, um, you know, people take, especially like, for example, a mountain guide might take a rescue sled, a repair kit, a medical kit, and think nothing about putting all that in a pack. So um, I think it's really comes down to you have to weigh your personal risks and what equipment you bring. And if you want to bring an airbag pack, you are looking at another four extra pounds. In North America and uh, United States and Canada, the snowmobilers were early adopters, probably one reason is because the weight is not a, as much of a concern as in, is for those of us who are weight weenies because we're skiing uphill all the time. Uh, the cost is another issue, although this is a little bit debatable. I mean, air packs are expensive for sure. You know, 800 is the low end, 1500 is probably the high end. But, you know, let's say they're a thousand bucks, you know, a pair of skis are a thousand bucks pair of good boots, thousand um, bucks, your um, Avalanche trans, uh, transceiver shovel and probe, $400. Um, so relative to the equipment you're buying, it maybe is, I mean, not as expensive. Um, I did, so I looked at some actuarial tables from some life insurance companies to see what they valued <laughs> human life. And the best number I could come up was $9 million is, is the value of human life. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but I mean, you can't really put a price on a life, but it just gives you an idea of, of uh, the cost of airbags is probably somewhat of a deterrent. Um, training is definitely a problem with these, uh, not a problem, but it's an extra burden. So this is a picture of Portland Mountain Rescue doing avalanche recertification with Hood River Crag Rats, the mountain rescue team. And um, you know, having a peg airbag pack is just another thing that you have to remember to deal with. So I'm, I'm the kind of person that comes home from a day touring. And the first thing I do is get my wet gear on the drying rack, get my boots drying, um, take out anything that's either damaged or used, take out my food bag and I get everything ready to go for the next time. I don't know if it's going to be a mountain rescue mission or one of my buddies calling me at six in the morning to go skiing. So um, but the airbag is just another thing you have to remember to charge or you have to remember to disarm it and then rearm it so you save the battery and so not so much with the um uh, with the um uh canister packs but some of them you still have to turn off the electronic uh firing mechanism so um local community not just availability of packs but the local vibe in the community probably makes a difference so when uh, there's a, a few years where my colleagues at Jackson Hole's Teton Search and Rescue did a huge backcountry safety campaign, and they called it Backcountry Zero, and maybe, maybe many, many of you heard of this, but they really tried to reduce backcountry accidents, and part of it was raising awareness for safety, and so that kind of community awareness or like the mountain shop routinely doing avalanche awareness courses, I think there's another one coming up in a few weeks, um, that kind of community um, focus on safety probably makes a little bit different a difference. Risk tolerance doesn't really, it's, it's not really uh, that much difference, that different with an airbag as it is with helmets or with an avalanche transceiver. So do airbags cause you to take more risks? Probably. Does an avalanche transceiver uh, cause you to take more risks? Probably. I mean, imagine, if, I mean, you can do this little um, test on your own the next time you're out touring and you're at the top of a slope in the backcountry and getting ready to ski it, turn off your beacon and see how it feels to think about skiing a slope with a beacon off. And it's a different feeling than it is if you have your uh, transceiver on. So, um, and then the last thing is just professional recommendations. I'm a big proponent of trying to organize some, get some momentum in the avalanche professional community 
kind of give us all some guidelines, like should we all be bringing an airbag as standard safety equipment um, in addition to a transceiver and shovel probe, given that it probably, it may save more lives and it may be a superior safety tool compared to a transceiver, shovel and probe. I'm not saying you should go without a transceiver, shovel and probe, but look at another way. If you're traveling solo, and there's no chance of you being around any other person that might rescue you, an airbag is going to be more useful than a beacon, shovel, and probe because your own personal beacon and shovel and probe don't really help rescue you, your partners. Um, so I wanted to plug to Portland Mountain Rescue our me social media feeds. we got a really cool podcast. You can just search it, um, Portland Mountain Rescue, on your favorite podcast. It's really cool. We've got a YouTube channel. That's also at all these social media feeds, you can just find by searching Portland Mountain Rescue. We've got a Facebook page and an Instagram page and a website, but check out our Rescue Radio or our YouTube um, channel, which has lots of cool um, videos. And I think um, I'm gonna stop sharing here and I thank everybody. Um, I'm happy to take some questions or um, comments or, um other musings thank you so much christopher it doesn't look like anyone's typed anything into the chat as of yet but um that was a really great presentation and i actually didn't know a ton about the uh history of airbags so it's kind of cool to hear that it something that's been around since the 80s and it's still like slowly making its way into the mainstream um i was curious if you have deployed your airbag or if you have actually used it in like well that's a great question i i i've deployed a number of different airbags probably a dozen times and all of them have been either in my house or my garage or on the ski slope standing. And my friend, Dale Atkins, who's an avalanche researcher said, really, Christopher, you have to go run and do somersaults down a mountain and then try to deploy it and see what happens. And it's really difficult. But I was pretty close in the Wallawa, um, the Wallawa accident uh, avalanche that we had. Uh, I had my hand on my uh, uh, airbag deploying handle, but I was waiting to see what was happening. I didn't want to deploy it too soon. And then the avalanche missed us, but, um, so I've never deployed it in, yeah. in an avalanche. But you've practiced. Yeah. Um, how did you make the choice, I guess, to, to get one? Did you just have access to one and? Well, so, you know, this is kind of like, um, this is, this is like a question about getting a COVID vaccine, kind of like you have to look, weigh the risks and the benefits. And with, I'm kind of a safety guy. I've got a couple of kids who are now, um, you know, 21 and 23, so they're on their own, but I'm, I'm, I love skiing. I ski 70 some days a year, almost all backcountry. And I just, I just feel, felt like the extra pound uh four pounds of weight was weight worth it for the safety factor and the peace of mind yeah yeah that makes sense um oh we have something that came up in the q a someone is curious about uh just more details on why the avalon was discontinued in the u.s that's a great question. So the Avalon works phenomenally well because like like I told you if you have an open airway and you have a, at least a small air pocket, you can stay under the snow for um, maybe an hour, which is gives your uh, colleagues time, time to find you. But it did never caught on and Black Diamond couldn't, um, they just couldn't sell enough to make it worth them keeping it in production. But it was a, it was a great tool. I have a couple of them, but I don't use it. I just use an airbag, but it's a great tool and it works to save lives. And it just, it just didn't catch on. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Cause I know some of the bags, I mean, they still have like a little pocket for it, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. Not something that's sold. Um, someone's curious about avalanche classes. Um, and if there's any that you recommend. So, uh, yeah, good question. So if you, 
um, the, the mountain shop avalanche awareness classes are fabulous. I mean, it's a short, compact kind of know before you go, get the details to be safe. And so that would be the first step. If otherwise any provider that does what's called a level one class is fabulous. And they're really fun because you're out touring and playing in the snow with other people. Um, so a level one class is usually, um, like a, three or four hours of classroom and then two full days of snow work. And so it's usually a weekend. So a, a level one class, I think, um, you know, find a local provider. Mountain Savvy does them, I think on Mount Hood. And I think maybe the mountain shop has some connections to get people at least directed where to take a class. So a, yeah. a level one avalanche class. Yeah, and Northwest Avalanche Center actually has a great tool for yeah. finding classes. Um, on their website and then cough adventures which is kaf does a bunch of classes too okay so, um, i'll include stuff in a follow-up email for everyone who was on the call or signed up for the presentation just to give some resources um, mountain shop also put together just a quick like advantages and disadvantages of electronic airbags and um, the canister airbags just to give people a little more context for that um, so yeah. I'll also include that in the link. Um, there's a question came up asking if Mountain Shop rents these bags and we do not rent the bags. Um, like Christopher said, they're, they're pretty expensive. It may be something in the future that we decide to do. Um, at, this presentation was definitely food for thought because uh, we do rent um, beacon shovels and probes. So something to think about for the future. Um, oh, I don't know if you know this, Christopher, how long a canister lasts? Well, um, if it's, you know, it's, they're one and done. So once you deploy it, it's spent. But if they're the only thing that really degrades is the O-rings that, um, that connect the canister to the pack. So if you are frequently connecting it and disconnecting it, it probably those O-rings will um, wear a little, um, quicker and like the backcountry access which i think the mountain shop has is a gauge on it to tell the pressure so but it's it's going to last at least a couple seasons unless you're um, deploying it a lot or um, connecting it disconnecting it a lot i think they they recommend that if you deploy it then you put a new o-ring in and i think usually if you buy an air pa airbag pack they come with a new uh, a couple extra yeah. o-rings yeah they do they do um so they don't yeah one other question um, are there any fail safe deployment methods? Um, as noted, doing somersaults down a mountain and trying to pull the trigger seems difficult. Um, I thought I heard something like 30 seconds to inflate with a fan, but I missed how fast the canisters inflate. 30 seconds seems like a long time. Yeah, so all of the airbags have a Venturi valve, which basically when the canister or the fan turns on, it compresses the air and so it shoots out with more force and inflates faster. And so um, there's no fail safe way to deploy them. There was, uh, there's a Manuel Gleinschwein in Switzerland was experimenting with remote deployment so that like a heli ski guide could click a button and deploy a client's airbag pack if, if the client was caught in an avalanche, but that really, there were so many complications with that system that it never worked. So there's, there's no good way. And if you don't do it, if you don't deploy it a lot in practice, you don't have that muscle memory. And the instinct is to, if you have the pull handle on your left side, the in instinct is to pull it with your left hand. That was my first instinct, but it's much, diff much more difficult to pull it with your same side hand, or it's easier to pull it cross body. And it takes, it, it takes a while to learn how to use these devices, which is maybe one reason why they haven't caught on as much. 